This is Indian Country Today. Esquili Kata'a. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. It's difficult, if not impossible, for Alaska Native parents to find books their children can identify with. That void prompted one group to help four Alaska Natives write their first children's book. It's part of the Best Beginnings Seasons of Alaska series. Angel Angela Gonzalez, Joni Spees, Carla Snow, and Yari Tuli Walker all took on the challenge of writing from a child's perspective. Alyssa London and Vera Starbart have also written children's books based on, in Alaska and featuring Alaska Natives. And today we have a few of those authors on our program. We want to welcome Vera Starbart. Thank you for joining us. Of course, thank you. And Joni Spees, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, hello, nice to meet you. And finally, Angela Gonzalez, thank you so much for joining us. And Azun, everyone, great to be here. Angela, your book is titled Button Up, Fall in Alaska, and it talks about the change of weather and what families do to prepare for winter there. How did your story come together? Well, it just came together by um, trying to picture what we do traditionally in, our, in the village. So I tried to write it um, because we have so many um, little kids across Alaska who are not represented, you know, in, as you said, in, in books and literature. And so uh, we really tried to tell our stories from our regions in a way, uh, but also make it uh, very open to different uh, regions. So I just talked about what it's like, what we do in the fall time. And so uh, give us an example of what you do prepare, you know, because again, their uh, subsistence living is so much a part of Alaska Native life. Yeah, like one of the things that we do in the fall time is moose hunting. So um, they had a picture of um, someone going out moose hunting. So that's a really big tradition for interior people. And I know that there's a lot like caribou hunting, you know, different, different um, animals across the state during certain times, but in the interior, um, moose hunting is really big. And then um, there were some like pictures of uh, bird hunting. So maybe you, some late bird hunting, um, like spruce grouse and um, so a little bit of late berry picking. So those are some of the things that berry picking and hunting and gathering is really big in the fall. And, and the books um, are actually feature photographs of the things that you're describing. And so it's not just an illustration, but children can actually see animals and landscape that, um, that you're talking about. Yeah, they can see familiar, um, you know, looking faces, brown faces, um, which is really awesome. And then just scenery um, like tundra, you know, just things that they see in their environment. Uh, versus like a city street, you know, that they may be familiar with from uh, mainstream media. But um, yeah, seeing those village life is, is really important, I think, especially in young kids. And um, I know all of you have your books with you. So Angela, why don't you uh, show us your book and also pick a section out and um, just read us a little bit from your book. Sure. This is the cover featuring some really awesome uh, photography, like, like we mentioned. Um, and then I will read a couple pages. Um, the tundra is my playground while mama picks berries. There's a little baby. So it's uh, zero to three age, age range. Oh. And then we remember where we are from with the beat of the drum, grandpa says. And that's uh, my little ode to Molly of Denali. They had a awesome um, series, uh, like a um, show on uh, boarding school. And so that's just one thing that I think is really important in storytelling. Uh, and I'll read one more page. We love to eat moose meat. Off to the smokehouse we go. So there's the family moose hunting. So those are a couple pages from my book. Well, that's really, really great. I mean, to see again what is uh, normal and typical for Alaska Native 
uh, children. And so, and, and being a part of all of that, the hunt and then the berry picking and, and uh, understanding what that environment provides for the family itself. Have you had a lot of reaction from your book so far? I think it's just really excitement uh, for um, not only Alaska Native authors, um, many of us are new uh, authors, so that's a really big highlight. So it might be a surprise to some that some of us wrote a book. Um, and then also the photographers were all Alaska Native. So it was just an awesome collaboration to be a part of. And yeah, I think it's just really important that uh, we get an opportunity to share our stories in little, little ways. So. And it's really, again, looking at the seasons of Alaska and seeing, you know, what uh, takes place there because it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, for a lot of uh, kids and even, you know, probably even adults, uh, an opportunity to really learn about Alaska and life there. Uh, Carla Snow is another author and her book is titled Bye Bye Ice. And she couldn't join us today, but she did send a video and we can share it with you right now. Taking pictures with daddy. One, two, three, cheese. On rainy days, mommy and I snuggle with books. My boots keep my feet nice and dry during breakup. It's my special day. In the spring, we go looking for beluga. I like watching Auntie work with her ulu. Muktuk is whale. What a yummy snack. I share my skin ball with Appa. Mama and baby moose make a big splash. Um, and again, children will get a peek into Alaska Native life in, in her book there. Uh, Joni Spies wrote the book Mittens and Mucklucks, Winter in Alaska. And that's where we're at right now, right, Joni? Winter. So tell us a little bit about your book. Yeah, we're definitely in winter. It's about 10 degrees Fahrenheit outside um, this morning. And um, my book is really very special to me because I'm from Northwest Alaska and the book uh, really represents the children of the region. Um, I was not only born there, but I was an educator there for years. And having the frustration of um, students not being able to achieve, you know, national standards in their reading level. 85% um, of our Alaska Native students were below reading level for their grades. And constantly a battle. Um, we always knew intuitively, though, that uh, not, not all of the books that they read resonated with them. And to have it not only be a book from my region with pictures from my students and even from the elementary school, to me, it just seems like full circle and I'm really proud to be a part of it. Well, you bring up a really good point about, you know, being able to relate to a book. And, and if you can, then that probably prompts the child to want to read more. But if they're reading about something they just can't even identify with or understand, um, that's got to be a, a barrier to them reading more often and uh, increasing their reading skills. Um, so, you know, and most kids, you know, I'm looking at the title of your book, most kids are familiar with mittens, but uh, Joni, what are mukluks? So mukluks are um, our traditional form of um, boots and warm winter wear that we wear on our feet. And they're made of many different things because Alaska is very large. But for my region, we have, um, hard sole bottoms, which are made out of um, ugrakide or a bearded seal skin and crimped. And then the top is made out of various selection of fur, but they're extremely warm 
and they're used for dance, they're used for practical subsistence use and daily wear, and it's just a, a, a matter of pride of getting those handmade items out of your closet and wearing them, and this actually happens to be Rock Your Mox Week. So I had mine on yesterday and they kept my feet warm and toasty. <laughs> That's absolutely so true. You know, when we look at our traditional footwear and how it's, um, how it's uh, tailored to whatever part of the country you live in, and in your cases, we know what part of Alaska you live in, and then what items, you know, that you can get from your environment to make your shoes. Uh, do you want to read a little bit about, a little bit from your book, Joni? Sure, no problem. And I'm going to share a picture from the elementary school that I taught at. So this is great. Oh, where I live, where I live, we love to be outside. I wear my mittens and mucklucks to play outside in winter. Sometimes I wear my fancy fur coat that Anna made for me. Anna is an Anupiaq word for grandmother. Brr, it gets cold when it's dark out. I warm up with all of my favorite toys. <laughs> That's a great face. Yeah. Um, would you like for me to continue to read more? Well, I think that's fine, but you know, it gives people a little bit of a flavor of, again, of what your book is about. And um, incorporating the language in, into the, the book itself is also important. So uh, is there a way to, um, do you have pronouncers on how people can read that word and know how to pronounce it? We do. There's phonetically spelt version of the word. And I believe in the back there's a little bit of, um, a, like, a vocabulary list to go over words that were used, traditional words. And I, there's a huge push in uh, many regions of Alaska to um, bring back more of our indigenous language into the educational um, system. So I really feel like that needs to be represented in the literature that our children are reading. And um, if, if I continue and have the honor to write more books, that's one of, the, one of the things that I would really like to include is more of our traditional language. So those, those um, self-identification pieces or factors that students can uh, align with and therefore you know that's that self-empowerment that they get when they're reading something that is reflective of them and their culture. And that they're not afraid to speak their language when they're out in public right I mean to to know know the name of their language and then to also be able to speak their language and not have any kind of embarrassment about speaking a language that's not English. I think that's exactly that and also because there's so much not only stigma around our traditional language but the um, the sadness associated with the loss of language but on the other hand the flip side of that is that empowerment that people have especially our youth when they are able to have success and communicate especially with our elders so they can pass on that important knowledge before they're gone yes you know um, I'm Hopi and my son when he was a little boy I would speak Hopi to him in public, and one time he, he said he was embarrassed, and he said to me later on, Mom, don't, don't tell everyone our Spanish. And I said, Spanish? You know, what are you talking about? And then I realized he watches, you know, Sesame Street, and, and they primarily spoke Spanish on Sesame Street. And in his mind, he thought our language was Spanish. And so I had to, you know, tell him, no, we, we're Hopi and we speak Hopi. So, you know, again, that identification and understanding you know, when you see it on media, in the media, you understand and can relate when it's something from your people, from your culture. And uh, Angela, you had brought up Molly of Denali, and I think from that show, I've heard so many families and parents say, now they're so proud because they know how to say thank you in uh, Molly's language, Masi um, Cho. <laughs> so I'm not sure which native language that is from. Maybe you can tell me. That one is Gwich In. And she also, I think she mentions Anabaset, which is Khoikhan or uh, Danaka language. And there's one more, I think she says Chenan. So um, it's really cute to see young kids uh, across Alaska um, repeating some of those words. And even, even in the lower 48 too, 
it's really awesome to see our languages out there and being normalized. That's what we need, you know. And that's a good way to put it, to, to normalize these different native languages because there are so many and if we don't, you know, say the, speak, you know, out in public and, and we don't teach the kids, then, then they will disappear and we've seen that unfortunately happen throughout the years. So uh, it's just very interesting to see again uh, the impact that a simple one or two words in a book can have on the children. Um, let's go to Vera and Vera, your, your book uh, is really timely because it talks about the pandemic. It talks about uh, some of the things that we've seen happen here, right? So your book is called Raven Steals Toilet Paper. Um, tell us a little bit about how you ended up writing the story. Yeah, well, I think like so many right at the beginning of the pandemic, it was a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos, and a lot of hoarding of toilet paper. And I I was just thinking so much and there's some really funny stuff and some really um, heartbreaking stuff and some really good wisdom coming from our elders. And it had me thinking an awful lot about, we've been dealing with epidemics for so long and certainly every native community knows how hard our communities have been hit by epidemics in the past. So it had me thinking about what we've done in the past, um, how we've handled it and then it got me thinking about how Raven might have handled it, which is kind of a huge figure in um, both my Klinka and Denina um, background. <laughs> and it kind of turned into this poem. And then my poor dad, I, it, he's a wonderful illustrator. And it started with like one or two illustrations I asked him to do. And before long, he was doing a whole book. <laughs> it was amazing collaboration. I love working with him. I've, I've worked with them before on some theater projects and stuff but um yeah it kind of snowballed and I think the almost funny thing was I was like oh I better get this out soon because you know the pandemic's going to be over so fast and little did we know I had even more time than I thought um could have taken even longer um yeah it just kind of was both a reflection but also I just wanted to remind everyone, you know what, we've done this before. And certainly if we listen to the elders, the ones who've done it, who've gone through it, um, probably <laughs> a little inspired by um, an elder uh, mayor who wrote this just greatest piece, who was like, we've done this before, we know what to do. Angela probably knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> and it was just like, he was just like, if we all work together, and that's sort of the point of the book, um, we're going to get through this and, and be okay at the end of it. And, and that's a really important uh, 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 lesson to keep in mind as we're going through this pandemic. But we have a, a video clip from your book, so we'll take a look at that right now. Raven was flying around one day when he overheard Alaska's people say there was sickness spreading from far away and it would be on this land any day. But as Raven let all his fears give way, he heard the wise elder start to say, Don't panic! We just need to prepare. We know how to stay safe and take care. So Raven rushed off without listening for more, to prepare himself better than anyone before. Raven would make sure he took care of himself and get all the supplies before anyone else. Up high, Raven spied Wolverine at the store, carrying tons of toilet paper and more. Wolverine emptied the shelves of Spam, as well as corned beef hash can by can. So Raven decided he better grab stuff too, and swooped in and took all the beef stew. Raven got all the pilot bread, all they would sell, and swiped Wolverine's toilet paper as well. Raven was pleased he had all his stuff, and flew around crowing about his good luck. But when he flew over to tell Eagle about his day, Eagle told him to please stay away. Didn't you hear? Eagle said to his brother. We're supposed to stay a distance away from each other. Raven said, I guess I should have stuck around longer. Eagle said, This distance will make us all stronger. 
In, uh, in a lot of Native American stories, you know, Coyote is the trickster, but it seems like in this case, Raven is the one who is the trickster and, and kind of the naughty one going out to hoard and, and uh, not wanting to share and, and then gloating about it. Uh, what lessons do you uh, hope children can take away from this uh, story of yours? Yes, Raven is, is definitely our trickster up here. And I'm Raven Clint, or Raven Whitey in, in Clinkett too, so let's have a special relationship there. And I think it's, um, <laughs> Raven I think definitely represented the, the fear, I think that we were all feeling at the pandemic um, and sort of gave voice to those things that we were also worried about. I also wanna mention that um, that narration was done by Aaron Tripp, who's a Clinkett um, actor I work with a lot. And, the book was illustrated by Don Star with my dad, so I wanted to make sure I get those <laughs> those two amazing hardworking people to recognize. Oh, absolutely! And um, uh, you released the book. Uh, give us some of the reaction that you've had from people. Are are they identifying with Raven? Or are they identifying with the other characters in your book? Oh yeah. So I think the title "Raven Steals the Toilet Paper" just <laughs> gets the strongest first reaction. But I think people from that title think it's going to be just totally silly. Um, but I've gotten an awful lot of reaction um, about the elder and about the elder's wisdom in there. Um, and I've gotten probably the most reaction out of the illustrations, which I love. My dad did such a beautiful job um, embodying all these creatures who, you know, the sea lion has a mask on and the uh, pilot bread that they're sharing. Um, so. Uh, the kids' reaction is about the illustrations more than anything, which I just love. Uh, and that's really wonderful. And so for all of you, as you, as you have these books released out there, um, uh, looking at uh, the reaction that the kids have and the parents have, um, do any of you want to share any more stories about just that reaction to uh, the books that you have? Um, Angela? Yeah, sure. So um, I think it's really the way people feel when they read it. Um, they have a sense of belonging. Um, and I think that's um, whenever we see like even Indian country today, you know, it's, it's like, oh, this is my place. You know, we have a place. And so often we're left out of many narratives. And so um, there's definitely that part, but there's also the feel good feeling like, oh my gosh, I can give um, a book to this little baby, you know, uh, or this little child, and they can uh, feel a sense of also belonging. And that's really important and self-esteem, um, everything. And, and just having it in a, like a curriculum is uh, so vital nowadays. And that's what we really, what a lot of people say is like, start at the beginning. Well, this is the beginning. So um, it's just really awesome to be a part of that. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, before we go, Vera, any last uh, comments on your book or this whole process? Oh, it's just been such a blast to work with my dad, like collaborate with my dad, and then um, just honestly have a project that feels like sort of working through the pandemic and working through that, and I think Native people all over have always done that, sort of work through traumatic or hard situations with art and with working together. So it's been sort of my passion project <laughs> in, uh, during this time, and I just love people seeing it and reacting to it. That's great. And Joni, very quickly, one last thought. Yeah, I just, uh, like I said, as an educator, the whole goal is to get these books into the hands of the little guys and to start out young, just as, Ale um, sorry, Angela said, uh, knowing that there is a preschool potentially um, somewhere in the state that can look and see a picture of, you know, different regions of Alaska and um, see photos and maybe be inspired even at a young age, you know, and maybe hear a word that they didn't know and learn those little pieces and all of those little pieces come together and it just helps solidify who we are and empowers our, our our people our youth especially they have this special place in our hearts so it's such a beautiful honor to be a part of um, their their upbringing and that's really what this is about and to be a part of a group of Alaskan Native women and Alaskan Native uh, <laughs> 
photographers also I was able to recommend some photographers from our region and um, it's a it's a fun it's a fun start to a new kind of venture well, perfect. I want to thank all of you for joining us today to share your books, and we appreciate you uh, reading from them and telling your stories. Angela Gonzalez, and uh, we have Vera Starbard and Joni Spice. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, Kuyana. Ana Basset. And Eskuli, thank you for watching. Uma umukatsi ukalyani. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Thalohungva. Join us again tomorrow. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.